Where did the novelistic quality come from? Because the, f the film really feels like there's you're seeing this like extraordinary portrait of like at least a dozen, sometimes up to 16 distinct individuals that you really get to know over the course of the mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. Is that just a function of how that community <coughs> worked and the fact that you were so kind of embedded into each other's pockets throughout mm -hmm. that period? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a good way to live, actually. Yeah. I often wonder why we don't do more of living in blocks of flats and... Mm -hmm. and um, Share, share uh, more space. Share housing, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I certainly wonder why we don't do it as older people because so many people have old, have big houses and spare rooms and live very solitary lives. And that's a, St Kilda was a lot like that. Lots of places were like that in St Kilda. And as Kate said, when the, the um, well, she referred to the change in St Kilda, which came in the 80s when flats were started. And the reason they was, could be started is that they allowed um, uh, timber-floored buildings to be strata titled, which meant that in, instead of um, individual owners having blocks of flats, mm. um, individual uh, people could buy single flats. And that meant all the people who were on the dole, all the people who were really low income, all the people that um, shared lots mm. and lived really close together, they had to leave because those flats were bought by um, people who could, they went to work every day. Mm. And St Kilda changed quite quite quickly in, over that year, over that time. Because the Mandalay also stands in for the whole, that little strip yeah. is like the whole of the narrative of gentrification in that area at it's, the time. Yes. It's, yeah. so, so what isn't in the flats, well, the, what, the last shot with the renovated fa facade yeah. and then... It's about I think it's about five stories built behind in a separate building. Mm. So that was, um, and I think it's fifty four flats. I think <laughs> fifty four. Yeah. From how many original? Well, eighteen. But the, that yeah. empty block where the parties were was had been the um, the location of a um, an old house, right, which, right, right. which was burnt before long before I moved. Next in. to the ice rink, the former yeah. ice rink. Yeah. It, next to venue, the venue. Yeah. Which it was Earl's, Earl's Court, which was a ballroom dancing um, venue before, and the, on the other side, see, yeah, yeah, see, by the way, um, yeah, and and uh, Saint Moritz was was um, burnt just before that mm. was that, so that the funny thing is that the building that was put on the um, Saint Moritz side, the hotel is now going to be demolished. So that's that's a not a very big sort of cycle, why, why is it? Why is that happening? Why is it happening? Yeah. Why is it being demolished? Um, it's just not successful as a hotel. Yeah. It's, really. Mm. And I don't know why. That's the a good question. Wow. Mm. Meanwhile, the SP has just had a big renovation. That's right. Massive. That's right. The SP and the top two floors of the SP that were always empty are closed off have been renovated. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Kate and I are going to go when it's a bit quieter after the rush. Mm. It's, a, it's the latest uh, renovated new build, you know, place to go in Melbourne mm, 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 now. Mm. Yeah. Do you still see Kate quite a lot? I haven't seen her for a while, but mm. I talk with her a lot. Yeah. She's, she's, she has become quite a known planner. She's a spokeswoman for a lot of um, planning issues in, in um, Melbourne particularly. But she's worked all over the, year, the year world. She's an academic. As she said, I've forgotten. She said it so clearly in the film. My career has been made. Yeah, mm. that that sort of makes the whole film yeah. for me that part because it kind of feels like it's a delay, delayed reaction to you, you as a viewer, really seeing just what an effect uh, the activism has on the community as a bonding mechanism. Absolutely. That like it, it's you kind of need the struggle in order to remain a unified mm. whole, and yet. Yeah. The paradox of that is that the more you struggle, the the more it slips away, and then there's this mm. like long gap in the between the years ninety two and ninety ninety one and ninety three, where there's not a lot That's going right. on. That's is that right. were you? We were just still there, yeah. and we all tended to go in different directions. Was it non-eventful, or did something within the group sort of break down? In, in terms uh, no, of no. I, I think we grew up a bit. I think and yeah. got busier, and um, Kate, Kate, Kate was an academic. And she became a mum in that time too. Uh, I had Afra there, who's yeah. sitting here. Hello. Aphrodite is sitting there. Who's now twenty six. <laughs> wow. Twenty seven. Had you seen the film before? 
snippets. Yeah, in yeah. snippets. I don't know if I've seen it really as a whole. Wow. Well. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I still see Russell, who lives, who lives in Tasmania, who's, who's a film a, a film teacher and academic. Um, who else is in that film? Robin. Robin went to uh, live in um, Switzerland with his girlfriend, Charlotte. Is he the last guy that leaves at the end? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the gardener. Yeah. He was a tram driver. Um, and he's a great character, as you saw. He's very fond of Robin. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Lubin um, went back to live in Mandalay. I used to keep keep in touch with her for years. I took her to the hairdresser, and we used to go out. And she eventually um, fell into went into a care and be, fell into a coma for about four years. She was unconscious. Wow. And died died as an old 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 lady. Uh, um, after oh, coming so out of she the was, coma, or so she was in the no, coma. No, she didn't come out of the coma, but she. So Mrs. Lubin, who else was in that flat? Karen, you see, still a musician. Um, Chris? Chris is, oh yeah, Chris is living up at Ocean Shores um, and stopped making films mm. and music. So, mm. um, but he was a wonderful filmmaker. Lovely, good to have a retrospective of Chris's film. You did, you did a number of uh, I needed one. I needed right? one, one with um, One View mm. we did together. Yeah, and he did the sound on the first film. Mm. And I think he did the sound on the second, but the sound was, you know, I don't think he would admit to it having anything to do with the sound on the second one. <laughs> mm. so it's pretty rough still. It's, um, he kind of forget about 10 minutes. And Ken Sallows was yeah. the star of the, of yeah, the film. Yeah, I was going to ask about Ken that. Ken was the editor, and he's well, well known as an editor, and he managed to make a silk purse out of a sousier, actually. So how much footage was there when you stopped hours. finishing? Yeah. I had a hundred hours. And how did you how did you proceed through constructing a narrative? Did you keep diaries of that period? And did you? Oh, that's a good question. No, I'm pretty, I'm pretty rough and ready most of the time, yeah. so it was consistent right through. Um, we looked at it. We Ken could have cut it in a in a rough way, and then we wrote the script. The, the little bits of it was really they're just links, aren't they? And the animation yeah. was used to try and do something with the. the um, newspaper footage yeah. or cut, cut, uh, cuttings and uh, to try and keep that um, it was really long you can see how long it was and, and quite um, Do you remember how long the first ed edit, rough edit was? Um, we did it all at once he didn't start he didn't edit as we went Oh he, so he's fine cutting he's cutting He, d he started yeah. he's most remarkable because yeah. he could remember shots I, I'd logged it all by hand, it was logged and logged and logged. Wow. But he was amazing. He'd he'd watch something. This is what an editor does. You didn't log yeah. all a hundred hours. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I had the, I had all some of it the other day. I showed you. Wow. But, um, wow, wow. Oh yeah, it was just pa just pages and pages and. But he could remember a shot from seeing it weeks earlier, and even vaguely remember where it was. Really amazing. Was, sorry, was there any content that? Um, May have gone missing, or did you lose anything in that process? Or mm. No, would, I don't. Were you logging? I was so glad he was well. editing it. Honestly, he he just did an amazing job, and he 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 was quite fond of the characters too. So yeah, you can helped. really feel that. That helped, yeah. and and uh, and it didn't make them. He didn't try to make them all um, sort of nice. It was pretty accurate, I think. Some people would have started and edited as they went. I think you'd get a different film doing that. I, I definitely sort of got the sense that that it was m constructed as it was as you were going on because I thought mm. I, I couldn't quite figure out how you'd managed to get the balance of the different people mm. so seamless almost. Mm. Like, mm. But I guess the figures naturally emerged. Obviously, Kate was somebody that was very much at the forefront of the whole process, and you were maybe closer to her mm. than you were to some of the other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, she was really the main. The driving force for the whole pro um, yeah. is Saves and Kilda. You can see she had others around her, but it, when it came to the crunch, she was the one that yeah. was that was always in the media and always you know, answering the, the questions. And she had her head around the town planning issues more than more than most. Yeah, she seemed really really sharp. Mm. So how how did the project then get Film Victoria funding and and, and when did Georgia got, get involved? We got some development money. That was all. Okay. And. Um, I bought a camera. 
<laughs> wow. And um, so it wasn't on the back end. It wasn't in post production. It no. was earlier. Mm. Wow. Oh well, then they wanted. Then no, it's not true. At the end, we got some money because the idea was to transfer it to film mm. and put it in film festivals. Because <laughs> it played at the Melbourne <laughs> Film Festival. It played in the yeah. Melbourne Film Festival in nineteen ninety four. And um, on film, and it, but what a rigmarole because it ended up going on beta, beta, and the mm. cost of all that material it was just crazy. Probably more than it would have cost to buy the tapes to shoot the thing. Mm. <coughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. So a little video eight tapes about this big. So we had a little bit of development money, and then we had the, tr- the post production at the end, and and um, Ken got paid some money, mm. but um. And then there was that song someone wrote, that song, did you see that? Farewell to Mandalay, yeah, yeah. completely forgotten yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, an original song yeah. for the film? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Jay, you want to say? Um, there, there are points where the film becomes more or less explicitly about the process of making film. And, yeah. And, um, you know, what is the relation of the film to what it documents and which is more important, the, the act of film or the issues which it's bringing up. And... Mm. How, how did your idea of what you were doing kind of evolve and like, what sort of questions were you asking yourself while you were actually shooting about this? What I wanted to do was make something from the inside. I, that was all that really drove it. I, mean, I was interested in the issues. I knew about the issues, but that was my... As a filmmaker, I wanted to make an inside story. Mm. Um, and I sort of, sort of did. You know, yeah. it's... it's um, <laughs> But that was all. That was the the academic e- exercise behind it all, was to do something from the inside. Yeah. So is that is that answer what you were thinking? I think so. I, I was interested in whether it changed. Whether like when you started off thinking, oh, oh I'm going to make this this one film, and then over the years it, it became something different from mm-hmm. the. What you oh, in the end, it became a bit of an a bit of an effort. And, you know, yeah. at times you have to keep on knowing what's going to happen, knowing what to grab the camera. But that's not documentary is, isn't it? You just have to be ra- around all the time. And I think the end, when we, that gap and then the end, that probably was good, just having the gap, because it kept on going, kept on going. Yeah. And then we said, well, this is what happened. And then there's that shot when you go down the upper esplanade and it's all high rise, except for that one building, which is... Did you shoot much happened. during that period? No. No. No, I didn't have anything to, to put to in. To film, really, yeah. I can't remember what I was doing now, but had a baby. <laughs> Moved. <laughs> There's an interesting question that Kate brought up, you know, with, yeah. with uh, well, several of them about about resistance and changing. And Rod, they nearly went bankrupt, actually. The architect. The that the the group. So yeah. there was the lawyer, and then there was the, the architect, and another another um, couple of people. Oh, and um, up there, Kazali, of course, was. Um, yeah. Mike Brady was one of them. Mm. All put money in, and um, they had, and, and then of course, you know that process where the, the council, as Kate, Kate was hauled over the coals for saying, um, you know, the council are, are amateurs, but I actually say they were because they agreed to pay the damages mm. if their appeal lost. Well, that was a four hundred thousand dollar damages, and. Um, for the holding costs for the developers. So it's, it's a really big deal for a council to reject a big development. Mm. Not that they all have to pay damages, but if they try and push it further, they can often have to do that. So, so yeah, that was like a precedent Rod set up? Thornies, uh, well, she, I, think, I think we said in the film, um, it, it, it scared councils off yeah. from, from um, rejecting developments because... There might be that's so, that passed yeah. from the legal costs. If they ke- St Kilda Council kept losing development um, appeals at the um, at VCAT, and they just said we can't keep rejecting development applications because we can't afford it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's then that was another mm-hmm. stage when you know when development started really happening in St Kilda. Rod Thorley's uh, built a few other buildings, but I don't know after that. Mm. But uh, now when I look at it now, I sort of ha- see it in a slightly different light. I think we were a bit, a bit bratish and. Um, well, it was much about the community. Yeah. Mm. It was. How do you feel about the building now? That building, mm. um, it's only vaguely significant in in terms of thirties architecture. It's built in thirty five. Mm-hmm. A lot of apartment buildings built in thirty five. Um, 
So it's sort of token, though. It's yeah. definitely a token. All right. Mm. Would that all have been scuppered if you guys hadn't intervened? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That that funny, did you see, it's 13 or 15 stories that had this kind of concrete of arches and then two blocks and then right back. Th was it 13, I think, that the first proposal? Mm. But then the, the proposal for the uh, Novotel Hotel was 18 stories. Wow. And the councils yeah. at the time negotiated it back down to eight. And they thought they'd succeeded hugely. Of course, we thought they had failed. But that was really the early stage mm. of, of, um, of, of that development mm. along the foreshore. And now all along the foreshore, all the way up through. There are only two just, other buildings yeah. along there, or two big ones. Um, one just next up near the Esplanade Hotel, and and one next yes two I say two three maybe, and one next door to Mandalay, which was um, twenty stories. Mm. Precedents are everything in planning. I just want to touch on Pleasure Domes. That's one of the best animated and uh, mm. coloured film I've seen. Could you quickly, you are a true artist. Mm. My family all grew up in St Kilda, South Melbourne, Port Melbourne, and. That's the vision my mother always had. Oh. Mm. Thank you. That's, that's mm. my, I have to give you a copy. Mm. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> now you can do it so easily. <laughs> mm. Mm. Well, thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Bill and Chris, for organising. No they thank are you. Thank just you. lovely. <laughs>